Good evening and welcome to a special edition of Across the Pitch. We're the soccer show for people who think Ajax is something you clean your toilet with. <laughs> I mean, it is. Okay. Do you want to? Yes, it is. It is. Matt, do you want to correct it? Because you I, I'm the, over. The, the pronunciation, <laughs> it's pronounced Ajax. They're from the, the Dutch era of the Like Arjun Robin? <laughs> Arjun Robin, yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, I think you're doing a bit of double Dutch there, mate. You need some Dutch courage. <laughs> I shouldn't have taken French in high school. I guess I needed to brush up on my Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> on this amazing episode of Men Talking About Association Football, or is that soccer? We talk about association football with another guy. We learn about a sumptuous hunk of a man in frozen carbonite. Oh, wait, I mean bronze. And. The Callum's Club is open for business. If only we knew a Callum. Yes, we do have a special guest joining us. My name is Phil Kennedy, and I'm here with my co-hosts, as always, Aaron Ayers and Matt Robards. How are you? Hey, hey. And tonight is the first episode of our special interview series called The Callum Club, where we'll be reaching out to various Callums throughout the footballing world and bringing them onto the show. If you haven't had a chance, we did post a blog on our website at acrossthepitch.com slash blog talking about the prevalence of Callums in football. It's an interesting read if you (laughs) have a chance. (laughs) Uh, But before we get to the interview, we did want to have a quick chat about some big news in the world of the MLS. And Mm. we've run a couple of polls on Facebook and Twitter, but what were those polls about? guys and and, uh, what's your opinion on this well we're getting our first mls statue it sounds like david beckham uh, will be embronzed outside of the StubHub center there in la for the la galaxy the real Mm. question is if the other four spice girls would show up for the (laughs) syrup a reunion concert at the unveiling wouldn't that be grand? I'd go along to that. No, Hopefully actually. it looks better than uh, Cristiano Ronaldo's statue. Uh, I don't really, really want to. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, could you imagine? David Beckham is probably the most recognizable football or now ex-football player in the world. They've got to get that right, haven't they? Because, you know, he's got one walk eye and he's got a bit of a drool or a drop on one side of his cheek. This is going to be so much fun. Gee, they're going to have to vet this. This is going to go through some sort of committee. And (laughs) people aren't going to be happy about it, I can tell you. Yeah, hopefully they don't get chintzy on the sculptor. Hopefully they don't use the same guy that did that Mohammed Salah statue. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wasn't that that great? (laughs) How, How did that poll end up? We posed the question on both Facebook and Twitter. Who do you think would be more deserving of a statue from the LA Galaxy, David Beckham, or Landon Donovan? Right now, so far, we've gotten 17 votes on Facebook, 6 for Beckham, 11 in favor of Donovan. Twitter is actually running a little bit closer. Donovan has the edge, 8 votes to 7 out of 15 total. So we have 32 total votes in right now. Now the total is 13 for Beckham, 19 for Donovan. And what are your guys' thoughts? Who would you build the statue of if they gave you the choice? Landon Donovan, hands down. I don't think that there's any disputing that Landon Donovan was a better player for the Galaxy than David Beckham was. Certainly he scored more goals, won more championships, had more assists. I mean, he was MLS MVP. That's for him. David Beckham never won that. But on the other hand, David Beckham is a guy that he really put the MLS on the map. He's the reason that folks in in England and in Europe started paying attention to MLS in the first place. We've talked a number of times about uh, Sports Illustrated that I have from 2007, Welcome to LA, David Beckham. And 
I think what it comes down to is that the people who were watching the Sealand and Donovan play would have been watching the MLS anyway, where David Beckham, he brought eyes to the league that wouldn't have been there otherwise. And it, it really, it, I think it comes down to, like I had mentioned the other day, where let's say that LeBron James were to up and go to the English Basketball League. You don't give statues to people uh, who they, just make a league well known for a team, right? So teams give statues to team legends. Right. And so you look at, let's be realistic. If LeBron went and played in any other league in the world, he's going to be the best player, not only on that team, but on that league. And he's going to carry that team. I mean, you just have to look at what he did with the Cleveland Cavaliers and where are they at now that he's gone. You know, David Beckham wasn't at the end of his career when he went to the LA Galaxy. went to PSG, yeah. Yes, exactly. Not only did he go to the Galaxy, he was also put out on loan to PSG, Paris Saint-Germain, and uh, Juventus, I think, wasn't it, as well? Uh, Milan, I beg your pardon, you're right. This is a guy who can still clearly get big bucks from playing the game, not just this global entity, this global brand that he carried with him, he could still play the game. And if you're talking legends who deserve a statue, David Beckham made 98 appearances for the Galaxy in the five years he was there, scoring 18 goals. Landon Donovan made 247 appearances for the Galaxy and scored 113 goals. Yeah. 113, almost a century more than what David Beckham scored. Now, be it they were different players. You know, Beckham played more of that. Beckham did have 40 assists. Right. But even Robbie Keane, who came over, had more goals than David Beckham. I personally don't think any MLS team, because the MLS is so young, can really have a club legend yet. But if you're going to put a statue out there, it's got to be Landon Donovan. It's got to be. I have to quote David Beckham himself here about this whole statue situation when he says, and this is an excellent quote, can I just say, it's an excellent quote. Nothing amazes me anymore. (laughs) (laughs) it's it's time now for us to make a call up to the very chilly upper midwest up to minneapolis and we're going to welcome onto the show mls announcing legend and not just mls i mean this guy is literally called every league in the world we'd like to give a warm across the pitch welcome to callum williams Welcome to Across the Pitch. We have our uh, very first Callum and hopefully one of many Callums. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show, Callum Williams. Good evening, chaps. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. I am uh, honoured to be the, the maiden Callum that you have on your show. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you joining us this evening to talk about some soccer as we call it over here. We're yeah, honored cool. to have you on the show. We're excited to, to talk some MLS and, and everything else with you. Thanks for coming on. Yes, of course. Absolutely. Phil, did you want to have a quick chat to about how we decided to reach out to Callum? Have you spoken to him about this yet? Through Twitter, and I think you may have read the blog post, right? Yes, I, I saw it briefly. It seems as though there is uh, a slight element, uh, a fascination maybe, of, of the name <laughs> Callum. Um, so, I don't get it either, mate. I don't get it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I have no idea what the fascination is, but hey-ho, um, we'll, we'll get on with it. <laughs> hey, we heard you on the Phoenix Rising game down in Tucson when Minnesota was playing, and that was when I had reached out to you on Twitter, but you know, why didn't you call us for a beer while you were in town? <laughs> <laughs> I think the next time we have pre-season down in, in Arizona, I shall uh, give that set a ring, no problem at all. Um, you know, it, it's such a strange time in, in the world of Major League Soccer pre-season, uh, particularly from a broadcasting point of view as well, you know. It's all very last minute, all very rushed, and, you know, we weren't even made aware that we were going down to uh, to Tucson to, to do any of the games right, right until the week or so before the team actually got there. So, all very last minute, but, um, you know, as I said, next time I'm, I'm down in Tucson, absolutely, we should... Uh, uh, we should meet for a pint or two and talk about football. That's no problem at all. Sounds wonderful. That's my ideal date. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you're happy to get out of that 
polar vortex and they come down here to the desert for a little bit. Yeah, I was, I was. But what I will say is it, it was rather chilly, actually, a couple of evenings mm-hmm. that we were out to Sean, and uh, there was the one evening that uh, Minnesota United had played Houston Dynamo, and I, and I just got off the commentary, and I went down to interview our manager, Adrian Heath, and I thought to myself, God, it, it's chilly, you know, it really is. But, um, you know, I, I'm talking temperatures of 30 to 40 degrees, as opposed right, to, right. <laughs> I think, um, at, at that stage in, in Minneapolis, it was something along the lines of negative 15 with a wind chill of maybe 35 or something Ouch. it wasn't very nice I felt sorry for my poor wife here who uh, <laughs> you know was, uh, was ah. shivering beyond belief but oh, um, the pre-season workout was good you know just like players as commentators we, we need a little bit of a pre-season you know I haven't done anything on mic since uh, the end of the season I usually head back to uh, to where I'm from the UK and do a little bit of work on the football league or the Premier League and, and I didn't this time so it was nice to get some commentary underneath my belt and, uh, but as I said you know it was just good to to get down to, to Tucson, a city I'd, I'd not been to before. I hadn't actually been to the state of Arizona, so that's another one uh-huh. I can pick off the list. It was really good. It was really, really good. Enjoyed it. Sorry about uh-huh. Tucson, by the way. You'll have to come up the I-10 to the big city next time you're here and <laughs> yeah. check out. We've got the rising soccer complex up here, and it's a good time here in Arizona. You sounded great on the game for being your uh-huh. first time out for the season. It certainly got our attention. It did. Hey, Callum, I was joking around. I was like, this guy sounds like Martin Tyler. Who is this guy? And Phil's like, oh, that's the guy we're going to get in the show. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a compliment, all, by the way, Martin kind. Tyler. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. You're, you're all very kind. I appreciate it because I actually thought it was one of my worst afternoons I've had in a while. But um, <laughs> it's pre-season, as I say. You know, it's one of those things. I was just glad to be up to do some commentary. And as I mentioned earlier, I hadn't had a chance to, to do anything for a couple of months. So, but no, it was, it was good. I mean, I was very impressed with the Phoenix Rising as well. They, they looked a very good outfit. And, you know, it, it's, it's pre-season. So I think results don't really matter, in my opinion. It's all about the, from a tactical point of view and the shape. And, and obviously the fitness side is, is what the coaches are looking for. I thought it was good, and, and you know, thumbs up to FC Tucson, who did a great job in hosting us as well. So, you know, I, I'd only been to really Orlando and Florida area for pre-season prior to this yeah, year, right. so I didn't really know what to expect. I'd, I'd heard good things about the Kino Sports Complex, and I'd heard good things about the state of Arizona, so it was, it was really good to go down there finally. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad you had a good time in our beautiful state. You know, while we're kind of talking about your broadcasting career, I mean, you've been calling a a ton of games in the EPL, the Bundesliga, the MLS, and your bio on the Minnesota United website. You've called an MLS Cup, World Cup qualifiers, CONCACAF Champions League, Gold Cup, FA Cup. I mean, you've done a lot across the world of soccer. And so I just was kind of interested in on how do you rate the MLS compared to some of the other teams you've called or, or the level that you have called, where would you put the MLS as far as maybe in the world rankings as far as leagues go? Would you say it's that EPL status or, or championship or League One or where are we at there? So this is a, a debate that I'm sure we can go on throughout the evening. But <laughs> I think, in, in my opinion now, this will be my ninth year commentating on Major League Soccer. My word, that's gone fast. But in my opinion, having seen the league now develop at the rapid rate that it is, I would put it alongside a league like the Eredivisie, alongside a league wow. like the Championship in, in the UK. I think this is, this, this, so this is a really interesting debate I was having, as I said the other day. And If you were to put this league in most of the countries in the world, I think it would get a heck of a lot more respect than what it actually does. Mm, now, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it that around the world, this league is growing. And we all saw the Miguel Almiron transfer again, grabbing headlines mm. worldwide. Oh, yeah. yeah. Focus on Major League Soccer. You know, I had loads of ex-colleagues at the BBC and Sky asking me about Almiron and, and what, he's, what he can do and, and all sorts of questions. So there will be curiosity uh, about him. But, but also, as I mentioned, the eyeballs were then firmly on Major League Soccer once again. And, and it's not a bad thing. And one of the main reasons I compare it to, to the Eredivisie, I don't think it's quite as good Yes, but I put it in the same category because if you remember, if you go back six, seven years ago, mm-hmm. a lot of South Americans were heading over to the Eredivisie. Because I remember yeah. commentating on a couple of, of PSV games a couple of years ago, and, and a lot of these South American chaps 
players playing for River Plate and Boca Juniors and La Luce and all these big Argentine clubs in particular were, were going to the Eredivisie. Well, now we, we're seeing a change of gears and we're seeing them coming to Major League Soccer now. Interesting. And then interesting. they're heading off elsewhere. So mm. I wonder if, if the same conversation was had with uh, with Piqui Martinez coming from River Plate, winning uh, a Copa Libertadores, the, the highest honour in South America. And all of a sudden he goes and joins, let's put this into perspective, an American team that are three years old. You know, right. Now, I know yeah. they splashed a pretty penny or two, you know, Atlanta United, <laughs> but let's just put that into perspective. You know, that wouldn't have even been thought of just a couple of years ago. You know, the, the league is steadily growing. It's getting bigger and better Some of the year. crowds that they get apart. in Atlanta, too, I think was, what, exactly. 77,000 for the champions? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's just it's getting bigger and better every year, you know. It, it's a perfect time to be involved in, in soccer in this country, you know. Major League Soccer is, is really, really rising up the leagues, up the, the league ratings worldwide and, and whatnot. And, you know, the, the other thing as well, which I think really helped, I don't think too many people know this, but when Major League Soccer got the global television rights deal from a company called IMG, that was a, a, a real humongous stepping stone because what it did is it meant that Major League Soccer was, for the very first time for a lot of people, available. Right, and yeah. There's so many people now around the world that can watch Major League Soccer so much easier than they ever have done before. I was a part of the, the commentary team, uh, and it all came from a studio in London, and, and it went out on, on Sky Sports in the UK. It, it went out on Fox in Australia. It did, it, yes, it did. It went yep. on being sports in the Middle East. You know, it went everywhere. So, yeah. You know, I, I think there's really something to be said for that, that a lot of players are now seeing Major League Soccer for the first time. And I think what's happened is a lot of them have watched it and thought to themselves, actually, that looks like something I quite fancy. This question is on the sheet, so feel free to bump it if you want, guys. Going back to, to what you were saying about, you know, drawing in this talent from South America, you know, MLS may Not only having South the America, stature. but all of CONCACAF, too. Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. MLS, you know, hasn't had the stature in previous years. And do you think that's because maybe it has a blind eye to CONCACAF and South America and they're too Eurocentric, perhaps? Do I think Major League Soccer's got a blind eye to, to CONCACAF? Is that what you're asking? The football culture in, in this nation as a whole maybe sort of looks to Europe as the standard bearer, but are forgetting what's on the back door, you know? A lot of people are guilty, and I'll put my hands up here, and, and I will completely be honest and say, but where I was living over in, in England, living back in Europe, very rarely did I think about Costa Rican football or right. Brazilian football, or you know what I mean? It's just not yeah. really a region that you really think about because you have almost every other region at your doorstep, you know? And I don't think enough attention has been paid over to, to that part of the world from a European standpoint. From a, a Major League Soccer standpoint, obviously over the last... 10 years, but, but mainly really over the last five or six years, right. have they really been grabbing the, the best talent from whether it's uh, Colombia or Costa Rica or Ecuador, Venezuela, all these um, Central and South American countries, you know, if you look across the league, that there, there is a, a beyond a deluge of South Americans and Central Americans in Major League Soccer, which in my opinion is, is a good thing. Yeah. Obviously, you know, you need to develop your, your homegrown players, you need to develop the American players. Um, but I actually think that a lot of these American players have learned so much from the South American players. If you, if right. you think about the Premier League, for example, I, I was having a, a chat with a colleague of mine the other day about Harry Kane. Now, Harry Kane, for me, is, is one of the best centre-forwards in the world in England. Obviously, Never heard of him. He comes, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, yeah. <laughs> obviously, he's come through the Tottenham Academy. I think he was at the Arsenal at one stage, you know. In my opinion, if you think of the great centre-forwards from England, if you think of, you know, the likes of Michael Owen, and Alan Gira in the past, and, you know, debatably ML Heskey, or, or all these types of centre-forwards, that they were very British in their way. I think Harry Kane, you know, that's where my allegiances will lie forever, no doubt. Strikers I've ever seen, because he plays like a European. What I mean by that is his technique and you know, some of the goals that he scored from outside the box and everything, I just don't think that happened on a regular basis in the past. And, and I think it's happening more regularly now with the likes of, of him playing. You look at Jordan Sancho, who played in the Champions League today for Borussia right. Dortmund, you know. And yes. I, I just think having having foreign players in your league of choice, whatever it may be, is a good thing. And, and you know, I, I'll go as far as the Australian A-League right now, you know. I mean, look, right now, in my opinion, the, the A-League... They need to allow more foreign players in into mm -hmm. um, into the the roster because right, right. 
I, I get it. I understand why why you only have five foreign spots. I understand that you want to develop the Australian players, but look at the mess the national teams in right now. Right. You know, exactly. so in, in, in my opinion, you, you have to allow more foreign players to come into the league because ultimately it does rise the quality, yep. and then you can start concentrating on the young domestic players after that. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and the other thing as well is, like, not wanting to talk about Australian football, because that's not why we're here, but, you know, the, the best quality <laughs> talent does go off to, to England, generally, sometimes Germany, sometimes to the uh, era divisor. But so, yeah, I mean, there's no competition for the places, I guess you can say. Uh, I 100% agree with you on that. Well done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing is that just the, the CONCACAF teams as a whole have gotten stronger because of the MLS like that, the Costa Ricas and teams like that that you mentioned, Jamaica, some yep. of the island teams. They've improved because their players have gotten a chance to come over and play against some of these top talented players. And, and that's why we're starting to see where that the U.S. team maybe struggles to make the World Cup in, in some of these other countries. It's not so much that the, the U.S. team has fallen off, but these other countries have come up to us because they're coming over here and playing at the MLS now. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. And, and look, I mean, that's by no means are we slandering the, the leagues in Costa Rica and whatnot. I mean, if you, you, know, you look at the rosters of Alacualense and Herediano in Costa Rica, I mean, they're all very, very good footballers who play at a very high level. But I think now a lot of people are looking at Major League Soccer and saying it, it's arguably one of the, the top leagues in this region. I still think Liga and that tips it, but I, I think um, Major League Soccer is growing rapidly and so many people worldwide can see this and, and it's only going one way at the moment and it's a real, real delight to be a part of. Absolutely. So, uh, Callum, tell us, you know, you're, you're obviously English, but where did you get your love of the game from and, and, and who's your most loved team aside from uh, uh, Minnesota United? Uh, my love of the game came from sitting in a stadium in the city of Birmingham, which is where I'm from in the UK, yep. right in the centre of the country, in between London and Manchester. Uh, it came uh, from sitting on, on very chilly evenings with my father, watching Aston Villa. Oh. Um, and, um, you know, that, that, is, uh, <laughs> that is where my, my <laughs> love and passion for the game came from. And, um, you know, it's been a whirlwind of emotions supporting Aston Villa over the yeah. <laughs> last couple of years, you know, with the relegation and, you know, the playoff heartbreak. And, you know, it really has. But, um, yeah, my, my dad was the one who introduced me to Aston Villa. I remember him taking me down to a reserve game um, many, many moons ago against Southampton. And then we had a midfielder called Paul Merson, who was just coming back from injury at the time. And uh, Dion Dublin was playing at centre forward. Yes. The Ryan Purcell, you know, that was a really good era for Aston Villa. But, um, one of the most heartbreaking moments for me uh, in terms of Aston Villa was I was actually commentating uh, on the day that was, it, it was their relegation was, was pretty much confirmed that day. Yes. My, my poor wife was in the stadium watching as well, trying to support me as I was on the commentary. And, and it was Aston Villa at home to Liverpool. Oh, Aston Villa lost uh, by six goals to nil. Yeah. Oh, and, oh. Um, you know, I remember then we had to go to Old Trafford afterwards and get something. So our, our, our Relegation was all but confirmed, and I just remember thinking to myself, you know, I wanted to scream and curse and point fingers, get <laughs> my own personal pitchfork out, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But you have to remain professional in that atmosphere and environment. But it was very difficult, you know. I remember saying to myself, even Colo Torre scored uh, that particular day. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, <laughs> it was it was not a bright day in the future of Aston Villa, but. Uh, Look, that's my club. That's always going to be, um, you know, my, my, my blood is always going to be Claris and Blue. And... Well, that I, was so I had a comeback they had against uh, Sheffield last week. Did you see that oh, one? Yeah, I did. I did. And, and I was, again, I was uh, trying to be very professional. I was, I was watching it in the Minnesota United office whilst uh, we were just doing some work and uh, preparing for the, for the regular season and whatnot. And, you know, 3 0, I kind of thought, right, well, that's that, that game gone. And uh, I was. Firmly frustrated, and all of a sudden, you know, like, we're we get back to 3 2. I, I really start to pay attention again, and then uh, a high hanging ball comes in from the right hand side, and young Andre Green leaps like a salmon uh, <laughs> to get to, uh, get to the ball ahead of everybody. And, and I went appropriately bonkers, uh, <laughs> bonkers um, you know, to the point where someone actually ran into the production room and asked if I was okay. And I was like, I'm more than okay, don't worry about it, I am fabulous. <laughs> so, um, so, yes, I did see the game, yeah. <laughs> It's an exciting finish. 
Yeah, I think we all have those moments, Callum, when we're watching, uh, you know, our, our teams across the pond here when, you know, we're supposed to be working and they're, we got the game up on the, on the computer and when they score, it's kind of that muted celebration because you don't want to startle anybody. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. But it, it, it's one of the things that we just have to deal with here, isn't it? You know, but no, I, I think I was, uh, I was anything but muted on that particular afternoon. <laughs> I just got to ask, man, Aston Villa's only sitting seven points away from that last playoff spot. Uh, you, is there a chance of promotion this season? Oh, I hope so. I really do. But I mean, again, after the defeat of Brentford earlier today, it, it's looking bleak today. You know, I, I have a, a good friend of mine who actually went down to the game to London to watch it today, and uh, was texting with him, and, and he was just saying it's, you know, it just doesn't seem like it's going well. And you know, I want Dean Smith to do well. Um, he, he's actually from my town where I grew up, outside of Birmingham, a town called Great Bar, and uh, his, his brother drinks in my local pub. You know, and it's, so he is, you know, that that phrase of one of our own, he really is. So I, I really want it to go well for him. But I, I yeah. think at the moment, there's a lot of question marks. And, and at the moment, unfortunately, I think perhaps more question marks now than, than when Dean Smith first yeah. took over. So look, I, I hope they'll go up, but we're a big club. I know that guarantees you nothing nowadays, but <laughs> um, I, I, I do really worry that if we, if we don't go up over the next year or two, uh, you know, the worst could happen and, and we end up doing a Leeds United or something, you know, I, I, I yeah. am really fearful right now. Doing a lead, that's one of our favourite terms in this show. Yeah, doing a lead, that's one of my favourite <laughs> <You> terms. <do. laughs> Callum, you mentioned uh, in a Reddit, Ask Me Anything a few years back, that you first heard about the MLS when David Beckham moved over to LA. I'm a big fan of these double barrel questions, so bear with me. Uh, what's your opinion on Beckham as a player? We have our opinions here. And secondly, does he deserve a statue at the Galaxy? So first of all, I think the David Beckham that we all know here in the United States obviously grew the game humongously. And as you mentioned, the first reason I'd heard of Major League Soccer properly before, you know, I mean, I remember being a young 17-year-old when he came over uh, to Major League Soccer and was the England captain and I thought to myself, go anywhere. I don't know if he's gone to America, but was still playing when I came over here first in 2011 and got to commentate on, on a couple of his games and that was fabulous. And But I, I think he's, he's an exceptional player. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen anybody deliver in, in, in that era of the game. I don't think I've ever seen anybody deliver right. on a dime like he did. In terms of him being deserving of a statue, I mean, again, <laughs> that's something we could sit here and, and debate for a long time, couldn't we? I mean, what, what I will say about it is that he came to this league when he could have gone anywhere in the world. And, and for, for whatever reasons they were, I quite frankly don't care. His high-profile social life he, is what people judge him on, which I think is wrong. In my opinion, if you look at where this league was when he came over, I remember being 17, 18 years old when I heard that Beckham, our captain of England at the time, was going to go and join a team in, in the US. And, um, you know, he could have gone anywhere. I remember thinking to myself, being, being utterly perplexed, thinking, why on earth has he done that? You know, and, and look, I mean, people will say various different reasons, a lot of money, although not much compared to what designated players are, are paid nowadays in MRS. Oh, you know, quite frankly, I, I don't care. <laughs> he came here for all the right reasons. He came here to play football. Um, someone like him and his very uh, abrasive nature on, on the pitch uh, didn't change. So when you look at what MLS was when he came here, compared to where it is now, I think Major League Soccer was always going to get to where it is now. But I think what happened was Beckham actually sped it up by several years. I, right. I couldn't put a number on, on, on how many years that is. But I think he certainly sped up the process. I think if... Beckham isn't here. I don't think eventually the likes of Rafa Marquez and Thierry Henry come to Major League right, Soccer. Exactly, yeah. um, you, could, you, you could then argue the fact that you know many other players wouldn't have come here if the likes of Thierry Henry and Rafa Marquez weren't in MLS as well. So I think he started a, a snowball effect, you know. So, but in, in terms of what he <laughs> what he did for the Galaxy, I mean, it was what was it three MLS Cups in yeah, four yeah. or five years. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, I, I could see the argument for it, but what I will say is I, I think there are several people who probably should have been ahead of him in line. Um, you know, I, 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 what, <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I was just about to say, I wonder what a certain uh, US legend Landon Donovan is thinking right now. But um, 
Hey, you know, uh, who are we to say who is deserving of statues or not? And uh, quite frankly, good luck to him. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And you're right, he did do a lot for the game. And you certainly, I was the same as you come. Uh, I first heard of the MLS when Beckham moved over as well. I'm like, wow, okay, something. Yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> that Sports <laughs> Illustrated uh, that I have from 2007, it, it's it got David Beckham on the cover, not Landon Donovan. So I, I think that <laughs> what it comes down to is, is like what Callum was saying, the MLS, may have always eventually gotten to where it's at now but he may have moved the league five or ten years ahead of where it would have been just by doing things like putting the league on that Sports Illustrated cover it, in some ways he's um, you know invested in the league he's got uh, Miami or whatever it is uh, starting up soon you know which I, I again yeah. dislike the man because of it because come on Phoenix Rising needs a spot in that, in that uh, MLS squad there but uh, <laughs> I digress. Let's talk about this. So would it be completely wrong or irresponsible if US soccer or Major League soccer, more, more than anything, put a statue of David Beckham outside their HQ in New York and the Galaxy put a statue of Donovan outside their stadium in LA? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. that. That's the question. They probably couldn't get a permit for that in New York, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's true, yeah. <laughs> We have to remember, though, Landon Donovan does have the MVP award named after him. Uh, it's not like he doesn't have anything, you know, cementing his legacy uh, in has the anyone, Has anyone asked him if he wants a trophy? Maybe he doesn't want one. Maybe he's happy not to have his head up there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of seagulls in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the, the, the questions, Callum. Uh, last season, Minnesota finished uh, 10th in the Western Conference. Uh, do you think, like, what do you think are the biggest things the squad has done to improve over the offseason? Uh, do, do you expect them to improve this year? Is this a playoff team? Yeah, I, I do expect them to improve big time. I think um, over the last couple of years, I, I, I'm not entirely convinced that people, and when I say people, I mean the entirety of the organisation was ready for Major League Soccer. And it, it is what it is. You know, you also don't choose when you come into MLS, when you're given the opportunity, you, you have to take it, you have to go and do it. So, But I, I think um, now this is the first real time where the roster has been built. We've been built firmly with a focus on, on winning now. I think uh, the, the additions of Ozzy Alonso, obviously a 10-year MLS veteran, has won MLS Cup, won a Open Cup four times with Seattle Sounders. Jan Grigish uh, has come in from FC Copenhagen as uh, from Akin International. He's played at the top level in Denmark. Uh, we just announced Vito Manone has come in on loan the former Arsenal goalkeeper as well. All right, yeah, um, yeah. And um, we, we've also announced uh, a defender called Iko Para as well. So I, oh. I think that the main thing that, that Minnesota United has done this off-season is they've really addressed areas of need and they've done it the most aggressive fashion compared to previous years. So the, the biggest issue with this side over the last two years was the spine. Defensively, they weren't great. I think it's very unfair to point all the fingers at the back line as well. I think you have to look ahead of them as well and, and say, did they have enough protection? And, and looking at it over the course of the last two seasons, the answer would have to be no. Right. So with the additions of Alonso and Gregish coming in, I think that back line now will be as, as firmly protected as, as possible. Um, so I think it's, it's going to be a good season for Minnesota United. I think um, I, I would firmly expect them to be challenging to get into the postseason. That has to be the aim with Allianz Field. Alli Allianz Field is, is going to be the best soccer stadium in the country, at least until somebody else comes along and, and betters it. <laughs> and I, I'm excited, chaps. It's it's the, it, it's it's going to be a wonderful season for Minnesota United. And and as I said, look, if they get into the playoffs, I think that would be considered a huge success. That Allianz Field is just something else, isn't it? Like that is just a remarkable stadium. It's I've seen the the, the renderings of it. Unbelievable, beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, we're we're very very fortunate. Obviously, we we agreed a deal with Allianz, and you know, Allianz has uh, a sprinkling of stadiums all across the world, and they're all absolutely top class. And ours is going to be no different. So, but we're very fortunate. Um, I've had a couple of, of tours now. I, I'm trying to stay away from it as much as possible now, chaps, until we have our home <laughs> opening game in, in mid April against New York City, because I want to Fantastic. react organically like everybody else, but. I'm not sure that'll be the case. We've got a couple of events coming up, but I'm, um, <laughs> I'm going to try and, and, and see the least amount possible over the next couple of weeks here in Minnesota. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's big news for that town, hey? 
Yeah. So, so Callum, you mentioned you guys signed Ike Opara from coming over from Kansas City, defensive player of the year last year. Uh, obviously, you talked about the need to improve the defense, and it seems like that's probably the best option out in the market right now. A a known center back who can contribute, you know, on set pieces and is a stout defender. And so, obviously, I'm I'm guessing you think he's going to bring a lot to the field this year, huh? Yeah, absolutely. It was the right signing. And look, there were a myriad of different names that were mentioned. And, and I think ultimately the coaching staff have got this one right. The debate is whether they've spent too much on him. In my opinion, no. I think this is a, a really good signing, particularly when you look at how targeted allocation money and, and general allocation money work nowadays. We, we could go into all the weeds of this now, chaps, but let's not bore the listeners. <laughs> um, so I, I think, in, in my opinion, this this is a good signing. I know Ike from, from my time as a commentator at, at Sporting Kansas City, and he's a spry chap, very much a, a hard-working individual. He wants to make whatever the situation that he's in work. He, he did ever so well in Kansas City. And, and let's just put this into perspective. I mentioned earlier on the defensive woes for Minnesota United mm. over the last two years. 2017 in Major League Soccer, Minnesota conceded 70 goals. Wow. 2018 in Major League Soccer, Minnesota United conceded 71 goals. Wow. Only bettered, in, in wow. inverted commas, by Orlando City, who conceded uh, just a handful more. Now, bringing in Ike Opara, he has anchored the best defensive back line in Major League Soccer over the last couple of years. Let's just put right. into perspective. The 2018 campaign and the 2017 campaign for Sporting Kansas City, he was a part of a back line that conceded 69 goals in two seasons. Yeah, wow. yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a bit of perspective there for you. So yeah. I think we're adding a really important piece, especially with the way Adrian Heath wants to play as well. We've also added uh, Roman Matanel, who's coming over from Rome in, in Ligue 1 as well. So he'll be an important addition. So look, I mean, so far it's thumbs up for Minnesota United in terms of the off-season. Uh, I managed to get a, you know, a couple of hours with the coaching staff as well. We did a little podcast, which you can find on the website as well, talking about the preseason, and, and they were delighted. You know, obviously, they, they didn't win any games in, in Arizona, but they got exactly what they wanted from it in terms right. of the new players learning the, the shape and, and yep. learning you know, when to go and when to hold and or, or power, or when to when to push forward, when, when to press, you know, right. and when to go for a diagonal ball, all, all these kind of things. You know, they even tried Rasmus Schuller on the left-hand side of the three behind the forward, and, and Schuller, a, a Finland international, is traditionally a, a hard box-to-box number eight, but they wanted to give things a go, and, and look, this is what preseason is for, isn't it? So, you know, it, it's been a good preseason for Minnesota United, but there's, there's no doubt about that. I think we're already for the real thing now, March 2nd in Vancouver. Good off season is headed into a good regular season, and, and that kind of leads us to our next question. And uh, as Phoenix Rising fans, we honestly don't really have a favorite MLS team. So, <laughs> tell us why Minnesota United should be our favorite team, uh, besides having a great announcer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're far too kind. Um, <laughs> I try and convince you. The one thing I will say is I was really impressed with several things with Phoenix Rising. First of all, on the field, I thought some of the, the players really gave a good account of themselves. You know, I, I knew a handful of them from Major League Soccer. You know, the, the likes of, you know, uh, Colin Fernandez, for example, you know, and uh, Adam Jean has, has scored goals for Columbus Crew in the past. But I, I was really impressed. Um, with the likes of Jason Johnson and Junior yes. Fleming's on either side of Adepjan in the opening 45 minutes. Uh, Amadou Diar is obviously a player who's got a ton of Major League Soccer experience. James Musa was a part of the Swart Park Rangers, New Zealand yep. uh, international as well. I thought he was really good. And, He's all right. Uh, I was impressed with Kevin <laughs> Lambert as well. He was a, a big old unit in the central midfield as well. And, yes. And, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure what's happening with uh, Andrew uh, wheeler Omenu. The ex Atlanta defender, but I, you know, I thought when I saw his name, um, I kind of thought to myself, you know, I know, I know he was on trial. There was a suggestion he, he may very well play for FC Tucson this year, but I thought to myself, what a what a really good signing this could be. So I thought on the field, Phoenix Rising were, were a real joy to watch, and they fell at the final hurdle last uh, last season. But yeah. you know, with the roster that I saw, it looked like they played some really good stuff, and and no reason to think that they won't jump that final hurdle this service uh, coming campaign. And, and look, as I said, it's still early. I'm sure they'll add a couple of pieces as well, and. And also as well the fans as well. I thought the fans were wonderful. I was I was commentating in the stands actually that that first game. We had a couple <laughs> of uh, technical issues, which meant 
we had to myself and, and my producer and, and cameraman Sam Plucker, we, we had to uh, we had to broadcast from the stand and I was sitting, I did wonder about that. <laughs> yeah, I was sitting no more than, than ten yards from a lot of the travelling Phoenix rising bands and you know, they they gave me a fair bit of abuse and, and well done for them. <laughs> um, and uh, but but I, I thought they were brilliant. The banter was top draw. Um, and I can easily see why there are these little rumours now about uh, Don Garber, but perhaps, you know, taking a trip to Phoenix and seeing what it's all about, you know. It certainly makes sense in, in my mind, you know, that the TV market is, is big, which is what MLS are really looking to get uh, down to the bottom of at the moment. Um, and it makes sense, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm backing for you guys. I really hope Phoenix oh. get themselves an MLS franchise. That could be really, really good. Thanks, um, Callum. That means a lot, mate. No, not at all. But look, hey, for, for, the, for the meantime, before you guys do come into Major League Soccer, what I will say is follow Minnesota United because we are the absolute epitome of underdogs. All right. I think a lot of people, right. a, a lot of people seem to forget about Minnesota up here in the bold old north. You know, we, <laughs> when you talk about Major League Soccer, you talk about the, the flashier franchises, you know, the likes of LA Galaxy and New York City FC and, you know, to some extent, Sporting Kansas City and the likes of Seattle Sounders, Toronto FC. I get it. I understand. All these franchises are wonderfully run. But I think this year could very well be our year in terms of really putting the eyeballs on this team. We've already spoken about Allianz Field and how that's really going to help not only Port Royal Minnesota, but across the country as well. You know, I've been very fortunate chaps to have you know, commentated on, on a lot of games in a lot of stadiums all around the world. And, and I'm not just saying this just because who, who's paying the bills, but this will be <laughs> one of the best stadiums <laughs> I've ever been in. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, we, we had a little tour a couple of months ago just before Christmas and, and we got to see the, the commentary booth and where are we calling the game from and the facilities and everything. And I mean, you know, it's it's all good going and, and, and doing the stoke on a Tuesday night, but you're not going to get those facilities there. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's... Um, <laughs> It's going to be something special. It really is. And we're all very, very excited and uh, would appreciate any support that you guys can, can give to us. I, I think you can certainly count on my support. I think we may may have to have a uh, regular segment on Minnesota, the, the show this check-in. season. Yeah, we'll do a little check-in. <laughs> I've been to Minnesota Wonderful. in the summertime, I might admit. I, I don't think I could I could survive a winter there. But the summertime, <laughs> you've got that beautiful mall there. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm sure everyone knows about the Mall of America. Call us. No, but uh, we, we went downtown and we had a little wander around downtown there. And it was just remarkable. Like the Twins were playing and it was just... It was a really, really nice place, you know. I, I don't know. I think it sort of gets overlooked, but I was really impressed by Minnesota. Yeah, I think it's one of those cities that, that does get overlooked because it's obviously so close to Chicago. So, um, you know, not, not a lot of people really uh, really come this far west, particularly when they're, when they're coming from Europe. If they do go this far west, they tend to go down to Los Angeles, don't they, or, or those sort of areas, you know. Yeah. So it's a place that I think is overlooked a little a little too much, in my opinion. But, you know, my wife and I, we, we live downtown Minneapolis, and we absolutely love it. And, and you mentioned the Twin Stadium. It's Funny, I'm just peering out of my window now, and I can see the Twin Stadium from, from uh, where I am. And it's, you know, downtown area is is wonderful. It really is. But as you said, I, I, I would save the visit until the summer for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Callum. Last question of the night: Are you aware that uh, you have a namesake, another Callum Williams, who is a defender for? And, and forgive me if I pronounce this wrong because I've never heard of this town before in my life. He plays for Spenny Moore. Town FC in the English Sixth Division. Mm. No, okay. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I had actually. I, 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 had, I had heard this before because a friend of mine back home made me aware. Um, now I, I could be wrong in saying this, but to my knowledge, uh, and if this is wrong, I'm going to kill my friend who told me this. <laughs> this Callum Williams, he, he used to play. He was on the youth team at Newcastle United, yes, I believe. Yes, yes. Um, he was He was uh, operating there. And a friend of mine, and he went to see the, the U23s, God, three, four years ago, maybe. And, and Callum Williams was actually playing for Newcastle's <laughs> youth team. He, he texted me, and, and I was aware. So I did a little Google search and, and saw that he was playing for Newcastle. And then I saw that he'd gone on and, and played elsewhere. And, and I didn't realize he, he'd gone to spend more town. But, um, <laughs> you know, I uh, what, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can find him on, on social media. And maybe we can have a chat maybe who knows yeah, we'll bring him on the show <laughs> we'll have two Callum Williams in two weeks that'll be great <laughs> uh, no, Callum thank you very much for your time tonight thank you so much for coming on our little show you have no idea how much this means we're uh, blessed uh, and thankful to have uh, an announcer of your calibre on our show and we would like to wish uh, yourself and Minnesota United all the best for the upcoming season 
Thank you, chaps. Really appreciate it. Don't worry, I'll come on any time. That's no problem at all. Um, you know, what you guys are doing and, and what so many other people do in this country is so vital for the growth of soccer in this in this part of the world. We need podcasts. We need radio shows. We need people to be talking about the game as consistently as possible. You know, thank you guys for what you do. It, it really is appreciated from, from someone in my position as well. It, um, it's a big deal. So well done to you guys. And uh, I, I wish Phoenix Rising and everybody in, uh, in Tucson and, and Phoenix and everybody in the state of Arizona a very good year. And uh, hopefully there'll be a, a championship Crowned somewhere. Let's hope so. Yeah, oh, let's hope so. Go on, we cry yeah. for it. <laughs> Thank you for for coming on, and, and we'll definitely have to check in with you here later in the season. And, and like I said, we're going to be doing uh, a little bit on Minnesota. Maybe you know, once a month, we'll we'll check in with you guys and and see how you're doing. And good luck with the season. We'll be rooting for you from Arizona. Wonderful. Cheers, chaps. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, Callum. Have a great night. Thank man. you. Well, we just want to give a, a big thank you again to Callum Williams for coming on and talking to us about not only just the Minnesota United and an MLS, but he also talked about Phoenix Rising, who we got to see while he was down here. And he spoke highly of Phoenix Rising. It sounds yeah. like we have something to be excited about this season, right, guys? Oh, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He's a all, all around good guy. And we wanted to thank Callum again for coming on the show. And he was certainly enthusiastic about our hometown Phoenix Rising. And uh, we have a lot coming up on that next week, don't we, Matt? Yeah, next week we're going to kind of dive in depth into uh, this new Phoenix Rising squad. And next week we're going to be touching on who we think uh, is going to be the most important signing for us going forward this season. Looking forward to it. And I think that, like Callum said, that uh, we really have a shot this year to make that last step and, and hold the big trophy next year. Yeah, hopefully. I'd love to see us lift the uh, USL Cup. Yeah, I don't want another photo of myself in front of that Western Conference Championship Cup. Yep. Yep. (laughs) I need a bigger one. Exactly. We will chat with you again soon. (laughs) 